And I think we're live and I can see uh, a bunch of people coming in now. Thank you very much. We'll just wait a minute or so. Um, for people to get in. Thanks very much. Those of you just joining, you'll see we have a collaborative notes document. Um, Joy's just shared the link to that in the chat. All of us are free to um, use that um, to take notes as the session goes along. OK, I think most folks are with us now. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is, is Kevin Ashley, uh, and as well as my um, day job as director of the Digital Curation Centre, I'm also one of the co-chairs of the Active Data Management Plans Management Group, and this is a joint meeting of um, that interest group together with two of the working groups that we spun off um, four years ago now, I think, uh, following the RDA plenary in Barcelona. And the aim of the meeting today really is, in a sense, both to look back uh, on what happened since then, and perhaps also to repeat the exercise we went through then. And for those of you who weren't there, our plan there was when we just had an interest group, we felt um, we'd been talking enough. We now had some clear ideas of some things that needed to be done. And it made sense to set up some working groups in order to do those. We used that session uh, at Barcelona to discuss and prioritize uh, ideas for concrete pieces of work that could be achieved in 18 months within the context of an RDA working group. Uh, my recollection is that we had five proposals uh, at that time uh, and groups of people who volunteered to create um, the, the, the group proposal documents to carry those forward. Two went all the way through that process, the one to develop the common standards uh, and the one to do uh, develop rules around the exposure of DMPs, uh, a name that we picked, I think, as being more all-embracing perhaps than publishing, to think of all the different ways in which you might want to expose or link DMPs. At least one of the other ideas didn't turn into a group in itself, but effectively was, was picked up uh, in another group to do uh, with um, applying similar ideas to software, basically. So those working groups have either finished or are coming close to finishing their work. Um, we believe there's more to be done, but in the same way that we did four years ago, um, we want to make that the decision about what to do next as collaborative and as open a process as possible. Certainly the work on the, the, the common standards um, came from the fact that a number of us who are actually running these services really understood the need for agreeing some common standard. We didn't want to do that uh, purely uh, as an exercise ourselves within the co-development. We wanted to take as many people as possible with us uh, in developing that to make sure that everyone with a potential interest could agree what that standard ought to be doing uh, and how it ought to be created. Um, so I think that's enough from our point of view in terms of introduction of what we're trying to achieve. Does anyone have any questions at this point about what we're trying to do? And if not, we can move in. We've got a few uh, presentations, both on what the existing uh, working groups have done, um, and then on what uh, some of the ideas that we might have uh, for the future, as well as some uh, case studies, effectively, uh, of the use of D DMPs um, uh, in various contexts. So I think we're going to begin. Uh, I'll ask uh, Angus White, one of my colleagues at the DM, the DCC, and also one of the co-chairs of the Exposing DMPs Working Group, uh, is going to present uh, on, on what that group's achieved so far. Take it away, Angus. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and hope it's the right one. Uh, I think we're seeing a whole screen there. Yep. Uh, 
Yeah, just put it in present mode. Okay, thank, thank, thank you. Um, I can see that um, what I'm hoping uh, to get from this, this session is uh, your help in getting our recommendations uh, through to uh, the finish stage. Um, but to give you some background, um, this working group uh, uh, is really based around the idea that uh, if we uh, shared data management plan content at some point in the research life cycle, it can improve data management practice. And what we wanted to do was better understand needs and benefits and risks in this area. Uh, depending on different ways of, of, sh of sharing DMP content. Um, this working group uh, got approved three years ago now, uh, and we had our, our first session in the Berlin plenary, so it's, it's quite a while ago. Um, and my co-chairs are uh, Mary uh, Christine Giacomo Perbo, Natalie Mayers, Fiona Murphy, and Catherine Linsworth, and I'm not sure if any of them are on on the call, but hopefully one or two are. Um, so a, a, a quick overview of, of what we did. We had sessions in uh, five of the plenaries since, since then, including case study presentations and uh, polls on uh, priority use cases, uh, which we, we drew heavily from uh, the common standards working group and its collection of user stories. Uh, so we also did a survey um, on um, perceptions of, of need benefits and constraints, and we got 400 complete responses. These were mainly from uh, users of uh, uh, DMP Online, DMP2, and Opidor, the uh, French uh, to there was quite a high percentage of responses from researchers which we were pleased about. Uh, we also talked to funders, uh, some of the other uh, tool and service providers, and um, educators working with DMPs. Um, we drafted a set of recommendations, uh, and there's a link there. Um, which unfortunately I can't put in the chat right now, but uh, um, we'll do unless someone else can. Um, oh. uh, we've got some useful feedback on, on these and we're still actually drafting uh, the response. So what we didn't get to was to write up the case studies based on the interviews. Uh, at least three of those will will be done in the context of the Fair Sphere project. Um, we didn't really do enough interviews uh, with any of the stakeholders really, but especially funders and researchers. So hopefully that's something that others can pick up on. Um, and as I say, we didn't quite get to finalizing the report. Um, but uh, I, I, I guess the key points are the the benefits and the risks that we we found that people anticipate, and um, I think the the main benefit is mutual learning about data management practice based on the specific uh, plans that making people are making for their projects. Um, better feedback uh, on on the plans um, and how they're going to uh, get to produce fair outputs and um, potentially better quality data management if uh, uh, by sharing the anticipated uh, needs for support, uh, some of those can be taken up by, by others. Uh, and uh, uh, related to that, the opportunities to, to inform repositories and other service providers about uh, 
resource requirements. And the risks, I guess, are not that surprising and not that different from risks that uh, researchers and others uh, tell us about sharing data, so getting scooped, uh, disclosing personal, uh, uh, not so much personal data, but information that could potentially lead to disclosure, um, as, as well as DMP content itself containing anything uh, confidential or sensitive. Um, uh, and uh, um, while lots of DMPs could provide uh, good practice examples, they could also provide bad practice examples. Um, and the, uh, so I, I guess, uh, not surprising view that DMPs are, are burdensome unless we actually make them more useful, which is what we're hoping to do. So the recommendations, uh, summarize them here, there's a lot more detail in the in the uh, draft report um, and the, the consultation responses. So uh, there's 12 of them, which I've ordered here in order of uh, the, the responses about whether uh, people thought they were relevant and adoptable by the stakeholders that we were targeting them to. Or on the other hand, whether they needed to be worded. Um, so uh, I, I guess starting from the, the top, uh, clear licensing, in line with FAIR, uh, reviewing DMPs on criteria for FAIR data, uh, making the DMP content as open as possible, as close as necessary, borrowing that that uh, phrase from uh, the European Commission uh, uh, policies around data. Um, using the, the, the standard from the Common Standard Group, um, using the DMPs to, to document the, the outputs and um, the identifiers for the outputs. Um, assigning a resolvable identifier to the to DMP itself using community-recognized uh, terminologies for elements, uh, getting consent before exposing the content, um, advocacy, um, doing some further consultation around PIDs, uh, more work around the trade-offs between the risks and the benefits, and uh, one that go with got most unanimous um, support was um, identifying sensitive DMP content. Um, so just picking up on a couple of those, uh, there's no time to go through them all and um, we're still working out what, to, what changes to make to the recommendations, but um, this one on, on reviewing DMPs on the criteria for fair data, uh, which, uh, uh, drew on some of the practice that we are finding with uh, the funders, for example, the Health Research Board in Ireland and the European Commission, um, that uh, DMPs should uh, be about preparing uh, the outputs to be fair. Um, this was really, uh, this is one that uh, I think the wording wasn't clear enough. It just wasn't clear what we're, what we're talking about there. Um, and there was also comments that uh, is it clear that those criteria are really sufficient, which uh, they're probably not, but we, I think, just need to point to uh, more recent work and clarifying the wording. Uh, so, for example, um, there's been the, uh, uh, the DMP assessment rubric published recently from Science Europe and uh, a tool in the Fair Share project called Fair Aware, which uh, is about making uh, researchers uh, aware of what they need to do to prepare data to be fair. Um, so the one about identifying sensitive DMP content, um, this came from the survey and some comments in there that uh, to the effect that uh, some DMP content can be disclosive. Um, 
we also had comments in the consultation that it wasn't just about that, that uh, you can potentially reveal stuff that shouldn't be there about uh, institutional uh, uh, processes. Um, and uh, I, I think the change that we want to make there is just to uh, be a, a bit more um, uh, concrete and explicit about the need to integrate uh, DMP uh, uh, tools and support with the the workflows for uh, um, ethics and and since the data re review. Um, so I I I hope that um, uh, that quick taster. Uh, will um, uh, be, be in, enough to encourage you to uh, look at the other consultation responses and um, uh, maybe even join the working group if you're not already a member. And uh, we'll distribute the final report and uh, hopefully uh, get some further comments and continue to decide whether we're going to uh, submit these for, for, for adoption. Um, and yeah, I, ho I hope we can discuss more uh, these topics later. And Great. Later. Thanks very much, Angus. Uh, and again, invitation to you all there to, um, you know, contribute to, to the still a chance to, to, to comment on the final bit uh, of work there. Uh, and you can see uh, Natalie's shared uh, links there to um, the recommendations. Um, so I see there's one question in the Q&A so far. It strikes me actually as one that might make sense um, for all the presenters in this first uh, section to deal with. So if you don't mind, I'm going to hold that question for a moment and we'll go straight now um, to Thomas Mixer, uh, who's going to talk about the work of the other working group um, that was created as a result uh, of that presentation of the, the, the session in Barcelona four years ago. Uh, the one which is now already in maintenance mode on machine actionable DMPs and funder templates. Take it away, Tosh. Hi, <clears throat> just trying to turn on the stuff. I guess you're seeing my desktop. So I guess many of you have already been to the previous session on the working group. So I'm not going to focus too much on what the group did within the first 18, 20 months of operation. This is just one slide for all those who are not familiar with what we've been doing. So in a nutshell, uh, we have developed a recommendation on how to enable exchange of information between stakeholders involved in research data management. We believe that DMPs and specifically machine actionable DMPs can facilitate that exchange of information and can um, contribute to automation of the process and incre increase the quality. And machine actionable DMPs, as you can see, an example of specification in the left bottom. This is, they are not a questionnaire, they are not a template, so they are not supposed to replace anything what funders are actually asking for. But the goal is to express this inf information in such a way that the machines, that the systems can automatically read the information from the DMPs and also that the systems can automatically provide the information in these DMPs. So these systems are actually acting on behalf of the stakeholders, such as infrastructure operators, research supporters, or for example, funders. And currently the working group uh, is in the maintenance mode and we have a, a set of adoptions. In the bottom right uh, uh, part of the slide, you can see that all major DMP tool providers are with us and also some other national uh, research infrastructures. Uh, and I hope more of you who are new to this uh, recommendation would also like to join us. But today I want to talk about something different, something which is a follow-up from what we, ha what, what we have developed. So we are advocating use of the standard and as a working group, we are helping people get on board to start using the MADMPs. And one of the partners we talk to are the funders, because as you all know, DMPs are driven mostly right now by the funder requirements. So on the one hand, we want to have a, I want to have something that helps the researchers, makes it easier for them. On the other hand, we have to have something that uh, satisfies the funder needs. And here I have a set of three use cases. 
in which I'm trying to depict what we have and what the vision is where we can head to. And the first one is what we have right now. So we have researchers on the left hand side, they are writing DMPs, these traditional DMPs, they are preparing a DMP and sending it for a review to the funder. And the funder on their side, they have to open these PDF documents, find somebody who can actually read them, understand them, and provide some feedback to the researchers. So this process is very uh, manual and, and, and based on, on text documents. The second use case for which we've been thinking of a lot about this use case is with the use of MADMPs. And this is the difference here is that we would like to send to the funders, not a DMP as a PDF, but MADMP as described by the uh, recommendation of the working group as a set of fields which are machine actionable. And in this setting, on the left hand side, you can see that the researchers can benefit from the automation, from uh, for, from help from other stakeholders who can provide the information, who can work on this MADMP. On the right hand side, you can see that this MADMP has to be transformed to the human readable representation and then the reviewer can start assessing the, the DMP. So this is this is a situation when the machine actionability mostly benefits the, the, the left hand side, so the, the researcher and how the DMP is created and updated, but the funder still wants to, to have this human readable version as it is now. And the first use case we could have is that we have this left part of the figure with benefits to the uh, researcher, but we also create benefits to the funders so that the funders who receive the MADMP can automatically validate them. The fairness of the actions described by the DMP can be evaluated, but some other checks can be put in place. And only the um, summary, which is relevant for the reviewer, which really requires human interaction, somebody to look at the contents, is presented to the to the funder or in this case to the reviewer and this is this third use case where both sides both the researchers and the funders can benefit and having these goals in mind we were trying to check how well the recommendation currently uh, supports the needs of specific funders and we were thinking of okay we have to want to make this the transition from step one to step two and in the long term to step three use case when i say step i mean use case and uh, the main uh, problem that we knew that exists or may challenge was that the, the standard itself models specific fields like data access. So it indicates whether something is open, closed or shared. If there is any question from the funder, why have you restricted the access? There are some fields where you can put this, but this is not explicit. So we were thinking maybe we need to add extra field in which, the rest, in which the explanation for restrictions is added so that the funders are happy with the DMPs they are receiving. So this was the goal to support the current requirements of funders, because we are aware that funders are here with us, are listening, are following developments, and maybe at some point they will carry something else. But now to ease the adoption of MA DMPs, it seems important to be able to deliver a version of an MADMP that meets the funder requirements right now. Um, so what we did is something I described already in the previous session, that we looked at the templates from funders uh, from different uh, countries. So we looked in Europe for Science Europe and Horizon 2020. We looked for NIH in the US and NSF templates. We also took the recommendation, we also based our work on the discussions that happened during the hackathon last year in, in May, and we tried to do uh, the mapping. We were doing the mapping between the questions in specific templates to the fields of our standard to evaluate how well uh, the standard uh, fits to the questions. So here I have an example of a mapping we did for the NIH 2023 uh, template. So uh, the first three columns, A, B, and C, uh, this comes from the questionnaire from the template provided by the, by the NIH. And then they have the columns D, E, F, where we were indicating whether there is a complete mapping to the fields in the recommendation, partial or not. And in column G, we're indicating which, uh, which base specific concepts in the recommendation fit. So if we provide information, for example, on the data set keyword description and type, 
This should fulfill the requirements asked in the question uh, in the row number four. If there were some discrepancies, we were discussing and we were trying to identify any possible changes or additions to the recommendations to make it work. And as a result, we came up with some proposals for slight changes in the documentation, so a slightly extending the meaning of terms. And also we defined, um, I think, six or seven fields that could uh, be considered as a funder extension, so not modifying the recommendation itself, but using additionally, together with the fields uh, provided by default by the recommendation, and this would uh, allow us to uh, model all the information that funders are asking. Uh, so I don't want to steal more of your time, uh, just a summary. So the working group produced the recommendation and now we are helping in adoption. We analyzed MAD and recent funder templates and we identified that the mapping is possible. We just need to add few fields which support this human readable narrative part of the DMPs. The proposed changes on making the changes in the documentation of the recommendation of the funder extension this is something that we are discussing now in the DMP Common Standards uh, Working Group. And the next steps for this exercise is to create a high quality documentation and provide some specific examples. So that's uh, basically everything from my side. So if you have any questions, please join our group. Please participate in the recommendation adoption and you can always send your questions to any of the chairs of the working group. Thank you very much for the invitation and I'm open to questions. Great. Thanks, uh, Tomash. Uh, as I think I said earlier, I I'm going to move straight on to the next one and then we'll we'll pick up some questions uh, after we've had all three presentations about the existing um, working groups, people that mind. So, Daniela. Um, so, Daniela is going to be speaking to us about a, a, a group that wasn't directly created uh, out of that uh, session in Barcelona, the Active DMPs group, but is clearly doing work that's really uh, in our area of interest uh, around discipline-specific DMPs. But I'll let De Daniela explain that now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, also, a warm welcome from my side. Um, yeah, I will give you a short introduction about the discipline-specific guidance uh, for DMPs. Um, as Kevin mentioned, um, we are right in the beginning. Um, I hope you can see my slides uh, moving. Um, so the idea of um, this working group um, was coming up at um, the plenary at Helsinki, so uh, P14. And uh, we are now eight co-chairs. Um, and the working group is still having the aim to develop a discipline-specific guidance for DMPs. Uh, to create a common understanding in and across disciplines uh, for DMPs. Um, so it should reflect more the perspective from the researchers than from um, the funders, uh, because we are thinking DMP is a really interesting um, tool which can be used um, not only for the documentation for the funders, um, so for the um, workflow itself. Um, our starting point is the Science Europe template um, and the working group is still uh, counting now 40 members. Um, the coaches are meeting every two weeks and we are also having a public meeting um, every eight weeks. So everyone is uh, really welcome to the group. Um, we had some or we participated in uh, several workshops on discipline specific aspects. So uh, one was um, the creation of DMPs and the tools in the um, NFDI um, in Germany. It was running by the uh, RDMO um, community meeting. Uh, another one was uh, with uh, Sebastian from the DDP projects um, at the East Heinz days. And um, we also contributed to um, the workshop series from the Dini Nestor um, working group in Germany last month. Um, so our working program is uh, right in the beginning. So um, as I mentioned, uh, the idea was at P14, we had our first BOF at uh, P16, and we also had uh, one session uh, at this plenary. Um, we are um, yeah waiting for uh, the 
to be uh, recognized and endorsed. So we got the go from TAP on Tuesday. Um, so we are only waiting for the council. Um, and we, at the moment, we are still in the phase that we are we are creating an online survey, which will help us to create the um, discipline specific guidance for each discipline. Um, and in another step, uh, we would like to uh, run some uh, workshops and in the end, we would like to prepare uh, the discipline specific guidance catalog. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, we are still at the point that we are um, having a first draft of our survey. We discussed it um, in our um, session. Um, so the uh, questions are based on the Science Europe core requirements. Um, we have open-ended um, answers in the um, questions itself. And um, let me shortly re reflect on the input we got. So um, in our working session, we had four breakouts uh, for 50 minutes, and we had around seven attendees um, in total. And um, yeah, the information, the, the, the comments we got is um, that we need more definition, more description. Um, on what about what is research data so <laughs> it was a really uh hard discussion about what is research data in some uh, breakouts um we are so there are some questions we have to be more um concrete more paying more attention to details um and other ones must be more open um and uh, also the expansion of some parts, like uh, the parts on the guidelines. Uh, maybe we can link also their learning materials. Um, yeah, and I think the major point was um, that we maybe should think about um, embranching um, the questions so that we can have questions for the researchers and also for librarians or repository managers, funder sites um, to speak the language of their yeah, the, the, the participating group um, in this part. So uh, I think we have to uh, discuss this already. So our next steps, um, or what is our timeline? Um, we would like to send out the questionnaire by the end of May, the beginning of June. Um, and after uh, the analyzing of the results, we would like to begin with the um, interview workshops, um, which should be, I think, by the end of this year. Our next public meeting um, will be on June 9th. And um, we are also having some um, yeah, sessions where we can uh, present our working group. And the next one will be at the Dutch RDM experts on May 8th, 18th, sorry. Um, yeah, and if you would like to join us and help us with the work, we are right in the beginning. You are always welcome and yeah, you can find more information on our website. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniela. So that ends the first mm -hmm. section uh, of, of our session today, where we, we were looking at groups either which have already finished or which are just getting underway, uh, already addressing some uh, questions. So before we move on to the case studies and then really to that discussion, you, you all important discussion about what happens next, I'm just going to pick up um some of the questions from the chat briefly because we're running a little bit behind time so the first that i held off on dealing with came from joy and I, and I didn't want to deal with the time she wrote it during angus's presentation but i think it's possibly relevant to each of the speakers uh, and it's about plans to address both the care principles as well uh, as the fair principles which i think many of us have been focusing on uh, in this work I don't know if, if any of the speakers would care to respond there as to whether that's something they've thought about, whether it's something they believe um, is relevant to the areas of work um, they're dealing with. So, Angus, uh, Autonash, or Daniela, feel free to, to come on and, and respond. Um, our working group hasn't specifically looked at care principles and um, just for anyone who's not aware of them, uh, uh, I believe these came, came out of 
the previous RD plenary, mm -hmm. and they're, they're about um, uh, governance of uh, data uh, relating to indigenous communities. Um, uh, I would place them under the heading of, of ethics and responsible research and innovation. And I, th I think um, it's probably true that in the data management planning context, their principles have had much more attention, um, but there's also um, among um, uh, the policymakers and, and the funders side that uh, we've we've talked to, we know that ethical considerations are, are very important, and um, I would uh, I, I, I guess it would give them equal weight. So I I, I think um, they're certainly relevant, but um, uh, probably under that ethics and yeah. RRI heading. Okay, great, thanks. And I see those of you in your chat, anyone who's not already aware of the, the care principles, there'll be some links shared there in the, the, the chat to explain them. I mean, my guess would be these are probably least relevant to the work of the Common Standards Group. Um, but Paul, if you care to disagree, do say so. Yeah, I was just going to jump in. Um, I think they, the, the relevance is not clear yet because I think the care principles are as I understand it right now, are, are fairly high level principles. They're not, yeah. it's easily sort of encoded into a, um, you know, into, into um, XML or something. Um, but some of the concerns in the care principles do appear in the, the DMP, such as um, um, uh, statements around ethics and so on. So um, mm -hmm. I think that probably as the care principles are, um, realized and then gradually implemented and turned into sort of I, I imagine that some best practice will grow up around those where you know rather more concrete things will start to become an understood be um, good practice and I, I would expect the DMP to um, you know to keep up with those developments as, as they as they happen yeah indeed uh, and and potentially, I guess, Daniela will know, I know it's very early stages for your group, that uh, there will be disciplines where, where these will really be very, very strongly engaged uh, and um, others where, where perhaps they're, they're less so. So I'll just make the one other question we had in the Q&A so far uh, came from a, a Paulette. I'm sorry, I don't know your, your, your other name, but um, and it was questioning, I think, you know, what is the potential relevance for having a DMP after data is essentially after a project is finished and the data is notionally published? So we have had some responses to that in, in, in the Q&A, giving some potential you know, reasons why um, exposing a DMP is still valuable after that. Um, but I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. If not, we'll move on to the next stage of our program. Fine. Um, so we've got a couple of case studies um now um the first um from uh maria pretzelis is going to be talking to us about the fair island project are you still with us maria yep yeah. I'm here. great let me just go ahead and share my desktop and that's just a minute. Hope you can see me. There we go. I'll, All righty. Uh... All right. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Maria Pretzelis. I'm with the California Digital Library, and I'm going to talk uh, briefly about our work with new networked data management plans and our Fair Island project. Um, so the Fair Island project really has sort of two main pillars that we're working on. Um, the first is optimal data policies, and the second is the technical infrastructure. So the combination of these two coming together um, to create an environment where all data and knowledge collected um, by field stations that are run by the University of California are curated and made openly available as quickly as possible. 
So as part of this project, um, we are starting with our partners at the Gump Field Station and the Tetaroa Society. Um, they are both field stations run by the University of California and located in uh, French Polynesia. Um, I did want to mention that we are incorporating um, the care principles and um, specifically the TK labels, which is traditional knowledge labels, um, into our work here. It's written into the grant um, and we are collaborating in with uh, Maui Hudson and Jane Anderson, who were both very sort of pivotal for the care principles and the TK knowledge labels. So it is kind of baked into our work um, in Fair Island, especially on field stations that might be on indigenous, traditionally indigenous land. Um, so our focus areas, again, for the Fair Island project really are data policy and data management plans and how um, the two kind of interplay together. So as we are kind of perfecting um, these policies and the machine actionable data management plans within the Tetaroa field station. Um, we are expanding that out to other place-based research sites um, as the project progresses. So I'm going to talk specifically about the DMP side of the project. I'm not going to talk too much about the policy aspects, but really just the technical components that we're, we're building into the Fair Island project. Um, so the networked DMP is really kind of the fundamental glue that that kind of um, pulls this project together from a technical component. Um, so this this graph just really demonstrates how we're using um, the the connections between creating a data management plan in the DMP tool, generating an ID for that plan, utilizing the PID graph to find related outputs to the original data management plan. And I'll talk about specifically what that looks like uh, right now. Um, so obviously the sort of key part of this is an identifier for DMP, and that's come up a few times already in this session. Um, so just a few weeks ago, Datasite announced that they had um, an updated version of their uh, metadata schema that supports output management plans. So we now have uh, persistent, unique identifiers specifically for data management plans. Um, they have a great blog post kind of detailing that. They have documentation if you want to get into the specifics about um, how to generate a DMP ID, I would check out their blog post. Um, so really the, the key for this, for us, we've been partnering with Datasite um, for a few years now as part of an NSF grant that we have with them is really looking at the way that DMPs with the use of identifiers create an unbreakable link between the original data plan to the eventual um, project outputs. Um, so this is a, a graph here, a visualization of an actual DMP. Um, it came from our colleagues at Bico Demo, an oceanographic uh, repository. Um, they were kind enough to give us a great set of older data management plans so we could really play with um, the PID graph and sort of document the potential of the networked data management plan. So in this graphic, the uh, orange dot here in the middle, this represents the specific data management plan. I think it got a little cut off in this view, um, but you can see coming off of it, um, all of the data sets that are associated with that project, any um, publications um, that um, have identifiers. So behind this, every sort of component here is linked through the use of identifiers. So the idea is that as a project progresses over time, generates more data sets, more publications, maybe new people join the project, maybe they get additional funding. These networks, these connections expand over time and are tracked through the use of identifiers and the PID graph. So this is that same data management plan from Bico Demo um, represented on the DMP ID landing page. Um, so this is the DMP hub. We built this to one, to mint um, the, the IDs with Datasite, um, also to serve as kind of a simple metadata repository for DMP metadata. Um, it also um, uses, we use the DMP hub to record assertions made on the DMP over time. Um, and by that, I mean things like 
published articles that are connected to this project, published data sets. So again, these are all the same things that you saw on that visualization. So what we've been doing within the DMP tool coming out of the Fair Island project, as we've been working with researchers, um, you know, going to these field stations, we've been thinking about what are the sort of the very high level PIDs and um, controlled vocabularies that we can put into a DMP to create these connections. So we've added all of these. We're adding additional ones, especially looking at discipline specific um, DMPs, discipline specific um, researchers as they're coming to field stations. We're hoping to work with them to build on these um, identifiers within the DMP tool. Uh, so just last week, we released a new version of the tool really coming out of our work with the Fair Island team um, that this new release has several new features that are really important for the networked data management plan. Um, the first one is the research outputs tab. So this tab here at the top, this is just a screenshot of within the DMP tool. So kind of like what Tamash was talking about, we've traditionally been very narrative focused. That's what the funders want. They want that in the US, they want a two page um, text narrative document. So our users need to download a two page tech, uh, PDF file when they're done. From a networked DMP for machine actionability, we need more controlled vocabularies. We need more specific fields. We need more PIDs. So we added a tab. Um, that basically allows researchers to define specific research outputs and utilizing PIDs and controlled vocabularies and asking the questions that pretty much every DMP asks, like what's the format type of your outputs? Um, what data repository are you gonna put them in? What's the licensing access level, that kind of information, but defining it at the data set level or the research output level, which was new for the DMP tool. We also released a new feature so that users can generate a DMP ID, which is huge for networked DMPs. Um, and that DMP does resolve to the DMP ID landing page that I just um, talked about. So that's an image here of that. Oops. So we've got a lot of project partners um, in this project. We're continuing to develop it um, and continuing to iterate on it as we expand out of the Tetraroa field station and work with additional um, field stations as well. We're partnering very closely with the Techaroa Society um, and our close partners, Metadata Game Changers. Aaron Robinson is our project manager um, for this and we're continuing to develop and iterate on it. If you're interested in following more about the project, um, Erin blogs on the Fair Island website, which is just fairisland.org. Um, she's got a few um, in there right now about our work with um, policy aspects. And in the coming months, we're switching over and we're gonna be working more on the networked DMP and new DMP tool features. So we'll be talking more about that on the blog. So that is it for me. I am open to questions. Um, so thank you very much, Leah. I, I've, I've got loads of questions myself. I know, I know there are others coming up. However, as before, I'm going to hold off until we've got the, the, the next case study uh, and, and address the questions then. Um, and just to remark there, I mean, that, that uh, Maria commented in that slide at the end, all the different people they're working with. Uh, and in case you're not aware, the roadmap being re referred to there, that's the common code base that DMP tool, DMP online, and indeed a number of other instances use around the world. So, so hopefully we're going to see that, that functionality uh, emerging uh, in, in, in lots of systems soon. Okay, move on now to our, our final case study. Uh, and I should just mention, by the way, I should have done before. There is another listed on the agenda from Viola van den Enden, but unfortunately she's not going to be able to join us today. Um, so if I can invite Marta Teperek, who's going to be talking to us about the work they've been doing at TU Delft uh, about integrating uh, DMPs with other institutional uh, systems using many of the stands we heard about already. So go ahead, Marta, if you're ready Thank to. Thank you so much. Screen. Thank you so much, Kevin. I'm going to share my screen. So when I share my screen, I will not be able to see you. So if there is anything happening or if I'm running over time, just please stop me, interfere. Absolutely. I'm just trying yeah. to do that. And while I'm asking, so just remind everyone that we're, we're going to have at least half an hour at the end just to be able to discuss all these issues and work out what to do next. Can yep. people see my That's slides? Great. Yep, we're Super. seeing it. 
So I wanted to tell you today uh, about our project that we are just starting, about integrating DMP online with institutional systems. The project is just starting, so that's mostly for information for you to know uh, what's going to happen. I don't have the results to show you yet. I'm also speaking on behalf of our project leader, Masha Rudneva. I'm not a technical person, so in case you have some technical questions, I will try to get Masha to give you some responses. Just to start, to manage your expectation, I'm not going to be talking about a model, a framework or a standard. Of course, that's already implemented in DMP Online, but my presentation will be more focusing about how can we make our existing data management plan template in DMP Online and our existing workflows more effective in practice through those integrations. So just some context that I wanted to share with you before we start. Uh, I am based at TU Delft and TU Delft has its own institutional instance of DMP online uh, provided by the DCC. And I think importantly for that context, uh, in our case, data management plans are compulsory for at least three different cases. First of all, for most funded projects in the Netherlands, that's part of the funder's requirement. So if researcher receives public funding, most likely they will have to uh, prepare a DMP. It's compulsory for research projects where personal research data is being processed. And it's also compulsory for all PhD candidates. In addition, we also have in place already a manual workflow for uh, how to handle the privacy and ethics compliance, ethics approval, and it's all based on data management plan. And I wanted to say that our template, we have been working quite a long time on it. It's really based mostly on multiple choice questions. There are quite plenty of questions. They are all conditional, but they are mostly multiple choice with an option to elaborate further in the free text field. So here I wanted to show you as um, an overview of our workflow. I do realize that you can't see the details. That's a request that, uh, that our workflow is expandable so people can see the details. I provided a link in my slides to that same workflow on the website, so you will be able to see it in more details if you wish so, wish to do so. But basically, it starts with a researcher who writes a data management plan. As soon as a researcher writes a data management plan, they are approached by the data stewards. We have faculty data stewards at TU Delft who are offering researchers support if they wish to uh, receive such support. And then, depending on the type of answers they provide in a data management plan, they get the department from our privacy team, that's with regards to GDPR compliance, and from our ethics colleagues. They get also that relevant information to know whenever researchers are working with human participants. After that advice, so there is some editing uh, and advice from different teams going on, the DMP is completed, so the data steward has finished providing that support, their advice has been implemented, and that's the end of the process. So basically, starting from a DMP, researchers are able to be guided through all the different relevant institutional support units. So now, uh, quickly mentioning the project that we are just starting. So first, starting with the why. As I mentioned already, DMP Online is uh, already well embedded within TU Delft. We have a workflow for how to work with data management plans, but it's manual. The data, as you all know much better than I do, is already there in data management plans. So the question that we had was, can we make a better use of the data by integrating our systems with DMP Online? So what exactly are we planning to do? So we want to do uh, a free kind of in integrations and a dashboard at the end. The first integration is to do a proper integration with our authentication system. This is needed for us to pass on relevant attributes about researchers to DMP online, like, for example, the faculty affiliation staff category. This is important for us because that allows us to tailor the advice that researchers receive depending on their particular status. Then it's also very important, at least for European institutions, to comply with privacy regulations, so-called GDPR. And for that, that's a responsibility of institution to have a registry of personal data assets. That also applies to um, personal research data. And hence, what we would like to achieve, that instead of manual population of that registry, we can extract relevant information through the API of DMP Online to populate that registry. Finally, 
What we would also like to do is to connect a DMP online to our storage request system. So whenever a researcher tells us all the information about their projects, that automatically we can also make a request for a storage system which will be appropriate for their data. So this gives, of course, researchers immediate access to storage uh, for, their, for their research projects, but also enables our IT colleagues to keep provenance of all the different types of data sets which are stored on network drives. This is very important. I can mention a specific use case to anybody who is interested. And finally, with all these integrations, what we would really like to do is to have a dashboard for the institutions with some statistics, like, for example, enabling us to project some trends, like how much storage do we need in the upcoming years, and also the needs of our researchers. So in terms of how, uh, we plan to do it through collaborations. We have uh, a couple of people we are already collaborating with, of course, uh, colleagues from DMP Online. So thanks so much for joining us with these efforts. TU Delft is the service provider at TU Delft. And SERV, uh, who is our national infrastructure provider, provided us with financial and in-kind support to deliver this work. Plus, of course, our researchers and data stewards are important stakeholders in there to evaluate the usefulness of that work and other universities, other institutions. So if anybody is interested in that work, we would really appreciate your feedback and involvement. And in terms of the timeline, we are now scoping the project. We have to have it fully completed in May and uh, to at the same time start the development work, which we are already initiating, which we hope will be finished by the beginning of December. And we also have two public consultations planned. So I will show you the dates. The first one is on the 15th of June, between 11 to 12 uh, Central European time. That will be the time for the midterm review and feedback on what exactly will be done. And at the end of the project, at the 9th of December, we will also have the end results presentation where we would also like to present you with reuse opportunities. That's indeed our aim that whatever we do, whatever integrations we develop, we would like to share the source code with the others who might perhaps make it easier for them if they can reuse what we already have. And if you would like to keep up to date, we have a mailing list. Uh, so if you would like to drop a message to my colleague Masha, she will be able to add you to that mailing list. Of course, you are all welcome to attend the webinars. If you subscribe to the mailing list, you will be informed about those. And we will also publish regular blog post updates on our open working blog. I think that's it from me. That was just a pitch for the project, which is just starting. I hope I did not disappoint you that I have no results at the moment to present to you. I will try to stop sharing if I can. Thanks very much, Marta. Um, and, and that is great, and please not to apologize for all there. I think seeing these examples is, is, is one of the great ways at, as of identifying what work needs to be done next, or are we just happy to see the work that's been done already by these working groups exploited and, and deployed. Um, so we've got just about half an hour left. Um, I, I want to be able to move on to discussion soon. I do have... Um, one question that I hope is going to Im, inform that, uh, particularly, I think, for Maria, uh, but perhaps also for you, Marta. You, you gave lots of examples, for instance, of how you're using uh, identifiers in various ways uh, in the, the, the Fair Island project. Um, what interests me is, do you feel that the way you're doing this is, is fully supported and expressed by the existing work of the common standards group and do you or indeed that that group feel that, that perhaps once you've established good practice on how to do this um is it going to be necessary either to profile the standard or to add anything to, to it to codify how these different identifiers and use are, are used and i confess this is because i don't fully understand perhaps the implications of all of this yeah actually i think that the common standard was put together really thoughtfully. And for the most part, we've been able to keep a, um, what is it, compliance um, to the standard while adding all these identifiers and trying to, to work with um, the new network DMP. So actually, because it was designed to be so flexible with minimum requirements, we're pretty much able to fit everything into the existing standard. There's been a few instances where we needed extensions and um, our developer, Brian, has 
submitted issues to the the GitHub, and um, Tomash and his group have been super uh, responsive, and um, it really hasn't been an issue. So I think actually we've been we've been pretty good with it. I think the work about mapping funder templates um, is interesting because right now we've really been just mapping like the the high level metadata about a project. We're not mapping the narrative components um, because it's not really baked into the common standard as it is now. Um, so that's where the template mapping that Tomash was talking about kind of comes into play. So for now, I think actually we've been able to pretty much work within um, within the common standard, which is definitely a testament to the folks who built it. So yeah, absolutely. yeah thank you. Because <laughs> uh, I think what that definitely in, 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 in that discussion later, trying to understand how much can we address by a group that's just working in maintenance mode and perhaps making adjustments as you describe? And at what point are we saying, no, this is getting beyond maintenance, this is extending the standard? But I guess, Tom, I should, you and others can pick it up in discussion later. Um, there is one other question in the Q&A about repository IDs. If you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to suggest we take that discussion uh, offline or on the mailing list or elsewhere, merely because uh, I, I've in rather too many venues, um, seen lots of heated and in-depth discussions about um, repository IDs versus organization IDs versus various other things. And I'd rather we didn't get sidetracked into that right now. So the final part of what we're doing to open discussion, at least part of which is is, is going to be about the, the potential uh, for a set proposing a community of practice within RDA. This is a new form of, of entity within RDA as well as the existing birds of a feather interest group and working groups. And I think we've got Karen Brightman from TAB with us, um, who I hope is going to be able to uh, explain to us in uh, a few minutes just what this community of practice uh, is. Great. Good Thank to see you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so. Uh, Back in 2013, when we created, uh, when we launched RDA, our uh, basic uh, uh, way of um, of interacting with the community was the working groups. And very clearly, it was uh, uh, obvious to us that we needed a, a different forum in which to exchange uh, communications and, and, and get all of those experts together in, in, a, in a single um, uh, discussion forum. And so the interest groups were created. And in fact, some of these interest groups have been acting as communities of practice. And today it, it is clear to us that we need to provide a new structure in which to organize communities of experts that are uh, um, centered around a common um, research area topic or, or, or area of interest. And this is what a community of practice really is. It's a new structure. Uh, we have just gone through the process of approving the first uh, communities that will be launched uh, uh, within the next uh, trimester, probably. And the idea really is to provide a forum in which to exchange and communicate. And this is a sign of uh, the evolution of all of the work that we, we have uh, done within uh, the RDA community. I mean, you've been You've seen Angus presentations before, Tomas. Uh, a lot of the working groups are now finished, are, are done with their recommendations, are moving into a uh, maintenance stage. Um, there's the need of creating new uh, interest groups, perhaps even working groups for new recommendations as a follow-up to the work that has been done. And uh, we believe that a community of practice will create um, this uh, environment, this forum in which to organize uh, the community around what's needed, what's needed going forward. So um, promoting the creation of, of new working groups, similarly to what happened in the Barcelona uh, plenary where two working groups were spun off, the, the discussion on, on actionable uh, data management plans and so on. Uh, there are a few requirements. I, I don't think it's it's the place to 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 go over them. I, I will pass to on to Tom, Tomas, who will uh, talk about a specific community of practice that he wants to propose. And I'm here for any questions and any clarification. So so thank, thank you. you. Great. So yeah, well let's go straight. Uh, thanks for that explanation, Karen. 
uh, and we'll go straight to Tomash. Waiting for the audio to record to connect. I think you can hear me right now. It's yep, and we can see the slides. Okay, uh, so uh, this is a, just an idea, and I really would like to get your feedback on what you think about it. Uh, so I was looking at the requirements that the community of practice uh, has. So what are the things we should fulfill, for example, to create a community of practice around MAD and PEs? And in the screen, you can see that the community of practice has to be launched by a working group or an interest group that produced a recommendation. Tick, we have a recommendation. Members must come from 10 countries and three continents. So the interest group uh, has 380 members. The working group has 230 members. So I think we are able to, to find uh, good representation. What is new, what is different to the traditional process of getting approval is that we need letters of support from institutions. And in this case, I was thinking maybe we can get these letters from those who have adopted or are adopting the recommendation on MADMPs. And such a committee of practice is subject to a review every 18 months if it's basically doing stuff. And we need free cultures from free continents. And I guess this also shouldn't be a problem because we have people and we have a representation from all around the world in our uh, groups. But these are the these are the formal requirements of, of what you have to do to become a community of practice. And as you can see, this I think is feasible. But how I imagine the concept to work and what will be the relation. So community of practice would be something that um, we do anyway. So as you have seen in the previous meeting on the the EMP Common Standards Working Group, we had problems with our agenda that we had very interesting presentations and we didn't have enough time to discuss actually the maintenance of the, of the recommendation. We had to run through that. So we would like to leave the, the topics of maintenance, really discussing any features within the working group and then within the community of practice, create such a platform for exchange of um, ideas, exchange of experiences of what you do to adopt the recommendation, how was the adoption, what are the lessons learned. So basically formalizing things we're doing anyway. And the role of the interest group, the active DMPs interest group would be to uh, have the space to discuss things about data management plans, everything. So much broader topic in this case, because right now the, the meetings of the interest group are very much loaded with topics on the machine actionable DMPs. And this is not the only thing that is happening in this in this community. So this is roughly my idea, and I'm happy to, to get your feedback. And more specifically, if this is going to happen, we have to work together. So it's not just one or two people putting it together. Thanks. Absolutely, Tomash. And since this is now a discussion session, I'd invite anyone who wants to contribute, feel free. Um, just turn your, 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 your camera and or your microphone on. Uh, and interject. Um, if, if we were in a room, I'd be asking people to raise hands or something, but we're, 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 we're not doing that. And in particular, I'd, I'd, what I'd really like to do uh, before we leave this session uh, is to have some identified volunteers, um, assuming that you agree with this idea that a community of practice makes sense, and it certainly looks attractive to me, but some identified volunteers to work with Tomash uh, on preparing that proposal and shepherding it through. That's how we managed to get these working groups uh, set up four years ago after that meeting in Barcelona was that we had named individuals who put their hands up and said, I'm going to help write that document. So am I being met by a deafening silence now and a lot of people all taking one step back? Or does anyone feel that it's not a good idea to pursue this? Maria. I, I may regret this, but I'm, I, I will help write the, the document. I think it's a great idea and I would, I would love to help um, put it together. Great, thanks very much. Uh, and, and I think I can certainly say, um, if not myself, um, I can commit somebody from the DCC, at least I have the, the advantage that I can tell people to do this, somebody will work. With you on this and one thing i think it is really helpful um and um 
and thank you. I'm seeing some comments uh, in the chat, and Joy has suggested adding names to the document. I think that would be good as well. Um, you, you've already done something useful here, Thomas, in, in articulating how the role of the interest group would be different from the role of the community of practice. Because one of the questions that had occurred to me before seeing your presentation was, do we even need to continue this group if we also have a community of practice? And, and I'm saying this because I don't, it, it, it's all too easy for things like this to just keep on going because we have them. Uh, and and I'm definitely a great believer in, in saying that if a group feels we've done what we came here to do, uh, then the right thing to do is is to close it down, if only to reduce the burden uh, on, on uh, uh, RDA staff. But I think, Thomas, in what you've set out here, there does seem to be quite distinct roles. I wonder if other... I was also wondering myself what would be the, the difference, and that's why I was also asking uh, Karen to join us to, to today to give us a better feeling of what RDA wants to achieve by having community of practice. But then when I was drafting this, it occurred to me kind of normal that we cannot own the whole interest group only for topics on MADMPs. Uh, and that's the distinction I, I would see. And I think we would then give space to others. So I wouldn't close or reduce the amount of groups we have. I understand that some of you may be put aside, put off by yet another working group. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm also having myself some, some reservations here. And I think that's my Maya said maybe she will regret it later. But I understand that RDA thinks it's important to have these new types of groups. OK. Uh, in that case, maybe this is something which the group that's working on that proposal document ought to explore to really make sure that we can see distinct roles. Uh, and Karen, you've, you've stepped in here too. Yes, exactly. I think uh, um, we have de facto communities around. And, and for that, what I've seen today, it seems that you already have a community of practice. So uh, the, the range of activities and the scope of what you've done today goes perhaps beyond an interest group and does not even fit. We are, we're not even able to discuss what's going to happen in terms of the maintenance of the groups that are finishing up. So um, in a way, it's a level of granularity. So how do you want to um, uh, treat uh, all of the legacy uh, uh, contributions uh, the community has already uh, delivered over the last seven years uh, to, to, uh, to RDA? And how do you see it going forward? So it's a more strategic look. Uh, RDA uh, wants to support uh, the community in a way by by um, uh, creating uh, this specific forum and creating a single point of contact, uh, providing space in um, the plenaries, and also um, making sure uh, that uh, uh, you have the right level of visibility. Mm -hmm. Because with the growing numbers of, of interest groups, you know, it's, it's really hard to understand that, you know, your, um, um, interest group has uh, this much uh, scope with it. Uh, and the communities of practice are directly linked to RDA's mission, which is to disseminate and replicate uh, the use of data to solve um, societal problems. And part of that, a fundamental part of that, is to build the socio-technical bridges. And that's what a community does, answers to. That's the, the, the main point. And you're building... Uh, um, Cross disciplines, but also multidisciplinarity. I just saw a comment from Maria Luisa in which she says, "Look, probably people from my group could contribute as well." So I think this will give you a platform in which to be visible to all of the other working groups and interest groups that could cross disciplinary uh, uh, um, provide contributions yet to to the community. Okay, thanks very much, Karen, and thanks to those of you who have volunteered in the chat there. I, I see Daniela, Maria, Luisa, uh, and, and possibly some others there. It's scrolling past quicker than I can and track. My feeling is now that there's enough names there, enough people have put their hand up, that we've got the critical mass we need um, to help Thomas and others work on finalizing that document, um, uh, sharing with others. So can we agree, Thomas, that you'll 
we'll leave this open for other people to join with you but we've got if i think probably five names now already willing to work on doing that that seems to me that's enough people that it's not just one person's job now you ought to be able to make progress um we'll use this interest group to share with those of you here and to share with other members of the group who, who aren't able to join this session um, what we've decided today how you're going to take that forward uh, and also perhaps to, to articulate that conversation about yeah the relative roles here of actually are we going to wrap this everything up in the community of practice and the maintenance group for the the, the common standard uh, or do we still need the, the the two things i still feel that's an open question so we've actually technically still got 15 minutes to go we've already i it feels to me like we've addressed that one question is there anything else that we need to be thinking about now in terms of future work uh, and in particular again I'm, I'm thinking going back to the the, the work of the common standards group uh, are you all happy in terms of understanding your role as a maintenance group um, and, and I presume I, do you think the community of practice is going to be the right way to decide if and when you might need to establish another working group to to produce a successor to this or do you think the maintenance mode is going to be the, the, the way to go for the future? Paul and Thomas, go ahead, either of you. I'll just give my opinion and then uh, Thomas can uh, tell me I'm wrong. Um, I think that the current arrangement we have for managing the process of new releases and versioning and so on is pretty good. It's working really well. So I wouldn't want to necessarily change that. However, um, the way in which that effort interfaces with the community is is what I think the community of practice is about, and mm -hmm. I can't see that that could do anything other than help. So that that sounds like a um, a really useful thing to to um, perhaps focus the community a little more on that that effort. But I wouldn't yeah. want to move the actual mechanism out of what we have at the moment because I think it just works, and um, it just seems a bit of a shame to to um, to stop something that's working uh, uh, quite yeah, definitely yes yeah yeah if it's working don't don't try to fix it um absolutely um but again with, without without delving in too much to that issue of um, repository ids you know that strikes me as one area where um if some of the work that's going on in projects like fair island and and, and elsewhere helps us reach uh you know we've got experience that tells us that if you are going to use identifiers repositories these are the ones you ought to use or these are how you use them rather than any of the alternatives then that might be the sort of thing that i guess you you would want to pick up in in that maintenance work okay yeah and uh see paul's responded in in the chat there so we'd have more time here because we didn't have any preconceived notion in advance about how much more we might sorry thomas did you want to say something uh, i just i just wanted to fully agree what, what we thought paul was saying so the community of practice is not in a way a way to escape from the current mechanism because it works and it scales so just i think it gives us some better position to discuss for example with founders we are basically able to show that we are stronger that the things we are developing, which are a bit disruptive, that are new, I think it may be simply easier for us to negotiate to make the, the change rather than just saying we are just one of many groups who produce one of many recommendations. So this is the, 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 the benefit I see for establishing the community of practice. Yeah, and that, I'm really glad you mentioned that, Tomas, the, the, the funders as a group in particular, because that was one of the five ideas uh, that we discussed four years ago where a small group did volunteer to um, set up a working group around funders use of DMPs that that didn't end up producing anything in the end I think because at the same time the 
role of, of the Funders Forum and indeed I can't remember what other group we've got in which the funders are active in, in RDO is being set up. And there was a thought that perhaps it would be wrapped up in there, but but it's not really been taken forward. We did have the opportunity to present to the RDA Funders Forum the work uh, of um, your, your working group, I think. Was that just over 18 months ago in Helsinki? I can't remember. Yes, it was in Helsinki when we got invited to this presentation. Yeah. Yeah. So they're aware of this and we know it's generated a lot of interest and, and, and I think you're absolutely right, the community practice may be the way to engage them a bit more actively in describing, both in them describing what do they hope to achieve and us being able to make, to, to, to push to say, well, if you as funders want to achieve these kind of results uh, with, with using machine readable data management plans, then this is how you will have to act or this is what you will have to do to support it, or indeed to discourage other things that, that are gonna get in the way of doing that. Exactly, and I think there's this, this elephant in the room that nobody mentions is that I think they're similar, at least to my understanding, to the Gopher implementation networks. Maybe this is also kind of a network, this community of practice that we are trying to bring in the funders in this. So, I don't know, but but important aspect for me, I think, is getting uh, in touch with, with funders and having this stronger position here. Yeah, absolutely, and and certainly from our own discussions, we uh, and I know the folks uh, in, in the US and Portage in Canada have with um, our local funders. There is considerable interest in you know both in those of them that are taking up the use of these tools uh, in in doing something practical in terms of these integrations. I think there's lots. Of potential there. So if we have nothing more to do, we could potentially actually end this five minutes early and as Joy says, give you just a little bit of time to, to grab a coffee or to get your dancing shoes on and to join a virtual Kaylee, um, which is going to be taking place in the next break. I have no idea how a virtual Kaylee is going to work. Um, but perhaps we've got the chance to discover that in a few moments. So, as I said, we'll communicate this. Those of you who volunteered in the chat, um, I'll just point out to you, uh, I'm able to capture all of this. Um, your, your, um, so your names uh, will, will, will be on record. Thank you so much to those of you who volunteered. Um, thank you so much to everyone who presented um, and uh, for, for all the interaction we've had here today. Goodbye.